let's worship together. Come on, let's put our hands together, everybody. Sing this with me. And he saw Satan fall like lightning. And I've seen darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over is my name is registered in heaven. Come on, sing it with me. I believe in signs and wonders. I have a resurrection power. Still, still the miracle that I just can't get over is my name. my testimony from death to God, yes, cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'll testify, this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Sons and daughters, walk with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what we started. Our God will finish what we started. This is my testimony.
fix our hearts on you this morning. We say nothing is better. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You know, we're not just here this morning to sing some words that are on a screen. We are here to lift up the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here.
pray together church God we come here this morning in all kinds of conditions uh, all kinds of situations circumstances in our lives Um, I'm sure for many of us some really difficult things and for all of us this world we live on and the pressure and the darkness that's around us God we come here to find you to meet with you to know truth to press into your truth, to press into your love. And God, it's our desire that uh, together as your church, as we come here to, to meet with you in this way, to worship you, that our faith and our trust in you would be deepened this morning. That no matter what it is we're facing, we're going through, that through it all, we'll meet you there, we'll hold on to you tightly, and our faith and our trust will be deepened. May our hearts and our minds be open to all that you have for us today. May your blessing and your anointing be on Pastor Pete as he brings your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. What a wonderful time of worship this morning. You can go ahead and be seated. As you do, say hello. Give an elbow to somebody next to you. Say, how you doing today? How you doing today? How are you doing today, church? It's a beautiful day and it's so good to be together. This is my favorite time of the week. Anybody else? Favorite moment of the week to be together with God's church, with Jesus' church. Well, welcome to all of you, especially if this is your first time here at FCF Church. Uh, We're just honored. Appreciate so much that you would spend your Sunday morning with us, whether you're in person and you're online or online. And we would love to know that you're with us this morning. So if you would do us a favor and fill out a connect card, it's on the back of your program here in the auditorium. But if you're online, you can go to fcfchurch.com. Just tap the little connect button. Let's us know that you were here today, which we would really appreciate. If you are new to FCF, we have something just for you. Each month we offer a little event, just over an hour. It's called Discover FCF. It's where you learn all about FCF's mission, vision, values, why we do what we do, and more, how you can connect here as well. So if you're new here and you're trying to figure out that you wanna make this your church home, then we invite you to our next event, which is on Tuesday, September the 14th. And this one is a Zoom event, so we make it really easy for you. Again, just a little over an hour. We'll chat over Zoom and tell you all about FCF. So you can register at fcfchurch.com slash events or on your Connect card. Now we've been telling you about a really great event coming up. It's just two weeks away, September the 12th, Rediscover Sunday. This is your unbelievable opportunity to invite someone to church that Sunday. And what makes it so awesome is that we have this really cool outdoor event after the second service on the 12th. 
we have all kinds of fun stuff and if you tell your friends uh, about or co-workers they might think like oh really it's just some lame church picnic right well you'll have evidence to the contrary that it's much more than a lame church picnic you will have access today this afternoon to a video that you can share with them that looks like this Doesn't that look like fun? So share that video and you can share that. We'll, we'll post it on our Facebook page on YouTube this afternoon. You can grab that link, share it with anybody by text, email or anything, and then invite them September the 12th. We hope you will join us and that you will bring a family with you. So in just a moment, Pastor Pete is gonna bring God's word to us today. But before we do that, I have to do what we do every Sunday, which is we talk about giving, right? Don't you love it when we just talk about giving every single Sunday? But we do it because it's really important and it's also how God designed us. I ran a qua, qua, across a quote. That's hard to say. Say it real time. Across a quote. Across a quote. This week that really just uh, spoke to me. It said, our giving is but a reflex of God's giving. And the thing is, it's not a reflex for all of us. It becomes a reflex for us when we come to that point in life where we've been able to see something. And we see it deep down in our soul. We see how much God has given us. How much he's given us that we do not deserve. How much he does for us over and over again, even though we don't deserve it. You know, God doesn't give to us because he's seen that we're good and we deserve it. He gives just simply because he is so good and so loving. And when we come to that place, when we really see that in our own lives, it's just to reflect it's a natural response. We just can't help but want to give back to him. And we do so generously, joyfully, and enthusiastically. So if giving is your reflex, we invite you to give to what God is doing in and through his church. Uh, you can do that on the website, on our app, or those offering boxes that are on the wall as you exit uh, the auditorium each Sunday. So now Pastor Pete we said Pastor Randy starts a new message series next week called Struggling. This week, Pastor Pete is bringing us a special message. And I want you to hold up this. Everybody, can you hold up one finger? Okay. It's the one thing. There's this one thing. And we're going to find out what it is. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. That was significantly louder than I expected it to be. I expected to have to say it again and get another response, but that was fantastic. My name is Pete, and I get to serve here as the associate pastor. And isn't it awesome? <laughs> You're going to want to clap for this, though. Isn't it awesome to see how God is using FCF Church and what he is doing in our church? So exciting. My wife, Jessie, and I are incredibly blessed to be a part of it. 
We love Pastor Randy dearly wherever he is hiding. I won't show you, but I did just see his eyes over there, which was a couple parts of this message that I'm going to have to refer to him uh, from back there. It'll be a little more challenging, but it will still work. As Pastor Kim said, Chris, I didn't see my remote brother, but I'm guessing it may be here in the back. Yes, it is. And there I'm back. Okay. The title of my message this morning is the one thing. Ambiguous enough for you? This, what I'm going to share with you this morning, this one thing I believe has the power to change your entire life. And before you think that there's anything prideful in me saying that there's not, this isn't something that I've come up with. But I don't believe that there is one other single solitary thing that will have as much impact on your life as what I'm going to share this morning. And I know you're wondering, what is the one thing, right? Because it it has the power to change the way you view relationships, to change the way you see the future, to change the way you interact with people. It'll make you a better husband, it'll make you a better wife, make you a better parent, make you a better employee. It sounds like an infomercial, doesn't it? But wait, there's more. (laughs) Just be honest. How many say, I hate infomercials? Anybody? Okay, I am that person. They got me once. With a diet pill, I tried, and weird things happened. In, anyways, that is, it didn't work. But there, uh, there is, be honest. You say, I actually enjoy them. Go ahead. If you can be brave enough to say, I enjoy a good infomercial. Okay, see some hands up. I saw one hand up way back there. Now, now those that know Pastor Randy well know this about him. So his daughters know it, his wife knows it, Pastor Kim knows it, any, most staff members know this. Um, let me be careful here. I, I love Pastor Randy dearly. He is an incredible, incredible mentor to me. He is brilliant. He's an incredible friend. But even Superman has his kryptonite. Can I tell him? Okay. Pastor Randy has never seen an infomercial that he didn't like. <laughs> I'm not, am I, am I lying, Pastor Kim? <laughs> he comes into the, this is, now in case you think I'm lying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one real quick right here. <laughs> now modern optometry has been around for over 100 years, but we beat it with these jokers. These are create your own prescription. You just dial. Are y'all still there? I can't even tell. Okay, you are. Okay, just making sure. You just spin these dials and ignore the cracking sound. The plastic is stronger than it looks. (laughs) There you are. I'm talking with Pastor Randy about the message and they're sitting there under his phone. I'm like, I'm like, do they work? He's like, they're complete trash. (laughs) I hate infomercials because they're too good to be true. What I'm going to tell you this morning is not too good to be true. It is life-changing. It is one of the only things that has the ability to transform the human character. The one thing is this. Make studying and applying the Word of God a priority. This simple exercise will revolutionize your life. I could go through illustration after illustration of of people who engaged in just cracking the Bible, reading the Bible with no previous knowledge, which is a challenging thing because it's a collection of books, and it changes their life. So if you are new to faith, the Bible is actually a collection of books. Anybody know how many books are in the Bible? 66, that's right. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. There's about 18 chapters per book on average, although some have more, some have less, but on average it's 18 books. How about writers? Uh, Excuse me, how many authors? Authors, not writers. How many authors are there of the Bible? Anybody know? Um, I don't want you to miss this. How many authors in the Bible? There's one. Now there are 40 roughly 40 people that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote this book. But there is one author of the Bible. It's God. Come on. And this is his 
autobiography. It's his revelation of who he is to us. How many would say, I, you know, I want to be an immature follower of Christ? You know, Hebrews 6 says, let's move on beyond the elementary teachings. But you would say, you know what? I don't really want to grow. I want to stay kind of low-key. I don't want to get better. I want to be an immature follower of Christ. Can I see all the hands? Stephen Bond, put your hand down. I'm kidding. No. How many would say, I want to be mature in my faith. I want to grow. I want to get better. I want to continue to know who God is, and I want to make him known. If that's you, go ahead and stick your hand up. If you didn't put your hand up, it's okay. You might not be sure. That's fine. We're glad you're here. So if this book is this transformational, why don't we read it? Pastor Randy, have you ever met a mature follower of Christ that did not read their Bible? It's impossible, and here's why. If you want life change, if you want things to be different, if you want your character changed, you must read this book. This is an incredible stat. 168,000 Bibles are given away or sold every single day, not in the world, in the United States of America. So if this book is this powerful, why don't people read it? There's a couple reasons. I did some study, found a couple things. It's irrelevant. People think it's outdated, it's antiquated. It's, it's not for me. It's hard to understand. I mean, I'm not a scholar. This was written in another language and translated. And then you got... My favorite, I'm busy. I got too much going on. Sometimes you're so busy, you got to call other people to tell them you're busy. That's a different story. <laughs> Why don't we read the Bible? These are actual reasons that I think apply more to us. I don't think a lot of people see the value in it. I don't think we've made it a priority. Oh, I hear this one all the time. You don't understand, Pastor Pete. I don't like to read. Or not, nobody here, this last one, nobody here in this church, but other churches, I'm sure, other churches deep in the Congo, this is the reason. They're just lazy. So a book that has the power to change our character, yet we can't find time for it because we're lazy. John 1.1, 1, 1, if you're turning with me, if you're following your Bibles, you can follow, you can write this down. John 1.1 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. This is, in, this is in, it's incredible here, because it goes from a noun that's a person, uh, excuse me, a noun that's a thing, to a noun that's a person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. Point number one is this. Once this remote comes in. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus is the word. When you are reading this book, you are taking in Jesus. This is who he is. Revelation 19.13 says this. He was clothed. This is uh, the second coming of Christ. By the way, fantastic Bible teaching uh, from Pastor Randy on end times that is on, it is on YouTube, Pastor Kim, but I can't remember the name. Is it called The Great Deception? Yeah. yeah, check that out. It is phenomenal. Two of my other friends started watching it last week and were blown away. They're nine episodes in. He was clothed with a robe that was dipped in blood, and his name is what? What's his name? Say that. What is it? He's the Word. Jesus is the Word. Why does something supernatural happen when you read the Bible? Because you're taking in Jesus. He is the word. And look, this is, uh, I'm not trying to be hard on you, but look, you can't know more of God or you can't know God without knowing his word. You cannot know God without knowing his word. And I, this is going to be kind of hard here for a second. So, and I'm not trying to be mean. And I, this, this is not in my notes. So just popped into my head when I was standing down there during worship. I think there's people that say they love God, but I'll be honest with you. I don't believe you can love someone that you do not know. If you don't know this book, trusting and following will get you to heaven. I'm not saying it won't. 
But this is the revelation of who God is. I'm going to take it one step forward. Many have a cultural construct of Jesus. They have a picture in their head of who Jesus is, but their beliefs do not match the biblical nature of God. All the time in pastoral ministry, we see this. Start talking with somebody and you think, you know, and, and maybe they've been a Christian for 10 years, and they'll say something and we'll think, have, have you read your Bible? <laughs> I want to do this. Well, the Word of God says not to do that but they think they know better. And they'll say something like, well, Jesus would want me to be happy. No, Jesus would want you to be holy. You want to be happy. They have a cultural construct, a picture in their head of who God is, but it does not match the God of Scripture. We need to read our Bible. This is, this is another challenging verse. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are, what's this word? Destroyed. destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What's he saying? My people don't know my word. My people don't know my word. This is one of the most challenging verses I'm going to share this morning. And, and this, this rattled me a little bit. The first time I felt like God spoke to me through this verse, it rattled me. And this is why. John 1, this is kind of the end of that passage between 14 that we read and the first part of John. It says this, He was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not, what's it say? One more time. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did did not know him. Now, I know what you're thinking. That was the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the people of the time. They didn't know Jesus, but I would have known Jesus. Like, I would have known that God there, fully man, fully flesh, I would have known that he was God. And I need to do a, just a little bit of surgery this morning, but I don't have time for anesthesia. So please, see my heart here for a second, okay? Okay. Is there a chance that he's still in the world and we still don't know him? This book is the revelation of who God is. And a lot, statistically, 82% of Christians, not people in the world, 82% of Christians only read this book on a Sunday. Jesus is the word. Now, I love you. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be hard on you. I want you to know my heart there. Everybody say, Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. It wasn't bad for about half of you. Everybody else, Jesus is, Jesus is the word. Fantastic. Next passage we're going to look at is John 6, 31. If you turn in with me. How many still use a Bible? How many still, I'm curious. How many still bring this, one of these books to church? Okay, I love that. How many use this joker right here? Okay. Okay, I'm just, I, was just, I was just curious. So when I ask for a reference, some of you are turning here, but most aren't. Okay, our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 32, then he said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the bread from heaven. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down, come on, he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We've already talked about Jesus is, there it is, Jesus is the word, that's right. And he gives, comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. I love this. This is classic disciple right here. Jesus is speaking to them about himself. For the bread of God is he, is Jesus. He's speaking of himself. I am here on earth with you. And, and what do they say? Well, well, give us this bread. Have you ever been talking with somebody? And they're just not getting what you're saying. Like the majority of the time, about half the time when Pastor Kim's talking to me, like she's super smart. So I nod like I know what's going on. I have no idea what she's saying, but I just keep, just keep nodding. That's Jesus in this passage right here. What do they reply? Well, Lord, give us this. Verse 35, and Jesus said to them, I 
am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is the word. And number two is this. Oh, excuse me. I am the bread. He says it again in verse 48. He says it again in verse 51. The word is the bread of life. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. He's the bread of life. Jesus is the word, and the word is the bread of life. Isaiah 55, 2 says it this way. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your, what's it say? Soul delight itself in abundance. See, this is saying that we have a spirit man inside of us that needs nourishment. The same way our physical body needs nourishment, there is a spirit man inside of us that needs to get fed. And come on, the word is our bread. The word is our nourishment. Another passage says it this way. This is the temptation of Jesus. Matthew 4, 3. When the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become, what is it? But he answered and said, it's written, man shall not live by alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Come on, he's telling us, we don't just need physical sustenance, but we need spiritual bread. And this word is our bread. In scripture, there's all different symbols that appear. If you study, which I, I'm, that's my whole goal, this whole push, everything. If you're curious what the whole purpose of everything I'm going to say this morning is, is this. I want you to study your Bible. I want you to open that Bible and read it. There's some symbols that we find in Scripture. One of them you probably know super well. What does is, what is a rainbow represent? Faithfulness, right. Rainbow represents faithfulness. Um, how about wind or fire? What does that represent? Anybody know? I heard over here, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. How about trees? This one, not many people know, but it is a symbol in Scripture. Trees are a reference to us, humanity. Are like a man planted by streams of living water. We're a reference to that. There's another one. It's bread. Oftentimes, God and the Word itself are called or referred to as bread. So anytime we see the word bread in Scripture, it should change how we view that. Are you tracking with me? Every time we read the word bread, we want to think accordingly. So let's look here. Matthew, this is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily, what's it say? Now, do I think that that is a reference to God providing provision for us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I believe that this is only a reference to provision? No. I believe that God has a word for you every single day. He has a daily bread that he wants to speak to you. And he's speaking. The question is, are we listening? Because one meal a week, it's just not enough. 82% of Christians only read their Bibles on Sunday. So I'm on, on uh, I guess this was, it would have been Friday. Friday, I was home on Friday. And anybody work outside on Friday? By any chance? Anybody? Yes, yes. It was, it was a balmy 750 degrees. <laughs> and I was uh, doing some yard work. You know, all the rain, the grass going crazy. Jess and I have a little bit of land, so trying to clean things up. And then I go in and I'm working on, a, uh, came outside probably around 9 a.m. And it's, getting later. I've kind of lost track of time. I'm working on a go-kart, and, and, and then I find myself, like, I'm well, uh, trying to figure something out. Can't figure it out. I'm getting mad at a screwdriver. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like, stupid piece of junk. Like, I, I can't get myself past this. I feel a little bit weak, and all of a sudden I realize it's, what time is it? It's, it's two o'clock. Now, I am a very very spoiled man. So before I share this, you need to know that as the context for what I'm getting ready to say here. My, my wife just cooks me a, a, every day. She loves to cook. She packs me a lunch every day for work. I eat breakfast 
in bed more often than I should. So I'm spoiled rotten, just so you know. Okay. I walk out of the garage over, and Jessica's in her garden, and she's singing, and the birds are bringing her stuff, and she's like a little, like a little <laughs> Disney character in there doing her thing. Where is she sitting? I don't know where she's at. Okay. She's, she's like doing her thing, and, and I'm like, Jess, do you remember this? It's two o'clock. I'm starving. Now, she says, <laughs> this was classic. If you don't like the speed at which I provide you food, you're a 40-year-old man. Go inside and make yourself some food. <laughs> no, no, I, <laughs> Come on. Who, whose side are you guys on? <laughs> Now, was she right? Yes. But could she have said a little bit nicer? I feel like, yes. Still the answer. I was weak. I was tired. I was worn out. I was disoriented. I'm getting mad at a Phillips head screwdriver because I was malnourished. Come on. You know where I'm going with this. One meal a week. It's not enough. We have two levels of this, I feel like, with Christians. We have malnourished Christians because they're not getting their daily bread, or, this is a tough one, we have dying Christians because they're on the wrong side of a spiritual fast and they're not eating at all. Uh-oh. Now, what happens when we're not getting our daily bread. What happens as a malnourished Christian? I'm going to tell you. You are susceptible to the devil and it is incredibly challenging to fulfill and do the will of God. Because we are malnourished or God help us, we're dying and don't even realize it. John 23, 12 says that this, excuse me, Job 23, 12 says this. This is incredible. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. What's he saying? I would rather read the word of God than eat. Man, that that would be our heart's cry. God, I, I want you more than anything else. I want your word. I'm doing okay for time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna save somebody's life this morning. I'm gonna take a little, little, little bit of a left turn here real quick. Um, my, my wife, who was in my sermon way too much today, um, we have three, three kids. And she was, we had been married for eight years and then uh, got pregnant with our, our first, Ethan. And we went through this whole uh, having a baby with a lot of people watching that process, right? Jessica missed one Sunday for every kid. She was on the stage singing, had a C-section, and was back on stage within uh, two weeks leading worship. You can imagine a nine-pound, you see how she moves? It was no different with a giant protuberance off of the front of her. So that, that landed me here with um, Four things that everyone should know when interacting with a pregnant woman. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change somebody's life. I'm going to save your life this morning. The first one is this. I thought everyone knew these things, but apparently a lot of people don't. Number one, never ask a woman if she's pregnant. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't ask her. Wait a couple months. You'll be able to tell. <laughs> ask a friend. Don't ask her. Second one is this. It is, it is appropriate to tell her she is beautiful and or glowing. Do not say, you're huge, it's ginormous. Did you miss your due date? Is that baby, how much weight have you gained? No, none of that is appropriate to say to her. Don't do it. Number two, number three, excuse me. Don't tell her how bad your pregnancy was. I was in labor for 37 years. That baby was the size of a... She don't need to know that. She don't need to know that. You tell her you're gonna have a great pregnancy. And finally, don't put your hands on the person unless they ask you to. That's their body, okay? I don't walk up to you and be like, oh, you had ice cream last night. I see you like that. <laughs> don't do that. Nobody needs that. 
When Jessica was pregnant, though, her entire um, habits in reference to eating changed completely. It was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. She eats like a bird. She eats very little, but she gets pregnant, and all of a sudden, I mean, if if I put anything within arm's reach, it was gone, whether it was mine or hers. It was gone. It was crazy, and she she was adorable, though. I mean, I thought she was adorable, and then she had a baby. Now, Jessica normally goes to sleep around 930. A couple nights ago, we had a hanging with some friends, and 9.30 rolls around, and she literally just falls asleep, just <laughs> out right there at the time. When she was pregnant, she would eat through the night. So at one point, we're, we're um, I think we're watching, uh, I was watching a movie. She wakes up, and she decides, it's, it's like one in the morning. I'm, I'm working on my laptop watching, watching a show, and she gets up. She goes and gets um, a granola bar, a sleeve of Oreos, Two cups of milk, like she made a couple trips, and then Ritz crackers. And she ate those Oreos and Ritz like a wood chipper. It's like, ah, right down. <laughs> and then she goes back to sleep again. It was one of the craziest things I had ever seen. And so I'm talking to Jess, and I'm like, Jess, um, you know, are you good? She's like, I don't know. I'm just hungry all the time. This baby is a gelat. He always wants to eat. I don't know what to do. Now, during band practice on Sunday mornings, we were, our, our Snap count is what we call it. Starts on Saturday night. So we, we prep for Sundays on Saturdays, and we have a whole routine we go through. And uh, Sundays are an incredibly busy day. So generally, we might eat a granola bar or a piece of fruit on the car on the way to church, but generally don't eat until after the first worship set. Um, that was not the case during Jessica, baby, pregnant, first time, I remember at one time during band practice, I looked over, and she was seven months pregnant, had a bowl of Velveeta shells and cheese (laughs) resting. And, you know, if if the song was, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, she's like, I'm going to eat in the middle of the song. Like, she didn't care what was going on. She was going to eat. If you are hungry enough for God's word, nothing will stop you from getting it. It was real easy for us to say, we don't have time to eat. We can't figure out how to do this. Listen, if you are hungry enough, you will find a way. You will make it a priority. Got one more really challenging thing to say, and I need you to forgive me, and I need you to know my heart in this, because I, I mean, I, I like to think I'm a nice guy, but there's times that we want to tell you things as a communicator that you, that you want to hear and that make you happy, and then there's times where we are compelled to tell you something that you, that you need to hear. Okay, this is one of those moments. We say we don't have time. So I did a little research on Bible reading during COVID. And it broke my heart. Not everybody, but most people had significantly more time at home during COVID. And Bible reading dropped off almost 6% among Christians. Is it really a priority to us? Because you can do the research yourself and see that there were a lot of other very unhealthy activities where the opposite happened. Skyrocketed. Alcohol consumption skyrocketed. Pornography skyrocketed. We're satisfying our lusts. And I'm not, I'm not saying you're going to go to hell if you drink alcohol. The Bible's not anti-alcohol. It's anti-drunkenness. So don't write any letters to Pastor... Well, send it to Pastor Randy. It was his R. Goldenberg. It, send it to him. But is it really a priority to us? Or do we just, you know, other stuff we want to do? Jesus is the Word. The word is bread. I'm going to give you this, another, another passage here. Most of you know it. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Man, this verse has been like the cry of my heart because there's points in my life when I'm like, God, I just want more of you. And I can tell you, it doesn't start any other place but right here. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you can find it in this book. Jesus is the word. The word is bread. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice 
This is my last point. And puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose. I'm sorry, production team, I'm walking all over the place. And the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Jesus is the word. The word is the bread of life and the word is the foundation for life. There is no other place that you can build your life than on this book. It should be the foundation for your marriage, the foundation for your business, the guide for your parenting. Everything can be rooted in this book. So I, I love when I'm sitting with Pastor Randy and kind of talking through messages, like I'll like bounce things off of him and he, and he gives me this face when I'm talking to him, he'll go like this. He'll go, uh, and that means like you're close. Like you're right there on the verge of it. And I'll go, uh, and he says, okay, so how do we put this into practice? How does one build their life on the rock of Scripture? It's right here. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does what? We've got to put it into practice. We can build our life on this. I love James 1.22 says, do not be hearers of the word only, but be, another translation says, don't deceive yourself. We deceive ourselves at times. And maybe you're sitting here thinking, you're, you're new to faith, so I know there's people here that are new to faith and you're thinking, look, Pastor Pete, I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm young. Maybe I'm, I'm young and I kind of want to have fun like, like you've had your fun and, and like I want to have my fun. I don't want to build my life on this because this is like, it's like restrictive and, and it's, like, it's like a burden and I, I just, you know, I, I, I don't want to deal with that. Like I want to have some fun. This book is not a burden. I am incredibly blessed. I didn't go through some crazy rebellious stage of my life where I sold wild oats and I acted like a fool. And I don't look back and go, man, I really wish I had partied more or I wish I had smoked dope or I wish I had lost my virginity to some girl that doesn't matter to me. First John 5, 3 says, his Commandments are not burdensome. This is not a burden. It's a guide. This is God's way of saying, this is the best possible way to live this life. The best way. Like any parent that says, hey, I want you to do this. It's not because I don't love you. It's because I want what's best for you. This is not a burden. It is a foundation. And we're going to come through storms, just like that verse says. My question for you is, what are you going to do when the storm comes? We've just been through it. And I, as someone who has read the end of this book, can tell you there are more storms coming. What are you building your life on? I'm struggling to say this without becoming emotional. I remember when Jessica's mom had had some, some trouble having a baby when after eight years of being married, Jess and I get pregnant and something bad happens with Jess and the baby. And, and um, we weren't public about it. We had a lot of attention already. And, and so we weren't public about it, but there was a great deal of reason for the two of us to be concerned for our child. 
call the doctor, and he says, I want to see Jessica immediately. And we hung up the phone, put it down, and thought, okay, the storm has come. The rain is starting to fall. And I love, man, I love my wife. I'll never forget the way she reacted to that moment. She hung the phone up, sat down on the couch, and she said, baby, my Bible is on my nightstand. Please go get it. Because when the storm comes, you check your foundation. You check your rock. I apologize. This Bible says, Ethan, Peter, David, Jalot on it. A couple months after that, Jesse and I went to a baby shower where our, our families were there. I am a mess this morning. The pollen in here. Brian, can you check the filters or something? <laughs> going on. Went to a baby shower, and the members of our family gave us 11 Bibles for our son. Kids' Bibles, teenage Bibles, adult Bibles, all kind of Bibles. And this was the last one they gave him, and every single member of our family wrote stuff in this book, in this Bible, underlined it, and shared their favorite passages. And we prayed over it. And then I had the privilege of sitting down with my son and talking about it. See, I am so incredibly blessed. These are such tears of joy. I was praying before service and, and being emotional as I thought about what I'm sharing right now. And one of our production guys walked in and like, oh, are you okay? You're gonna do fine, don't panic. Like, no, I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, no. I was blessed to be raised in a home Jess was blessed to be raised in a home where our family said, we're going to make this book the foundation of our lives. We're going to build our families on this. When my sister and brothers and Jessica's sisters underlined passages in this and we prayed for this book, I had the privilege of sitting down with Ethan and saying, Ethan, all, you see all of the blessings that mommy and daddy have. Everything that Papa Bernie and Nana Kathy Poppy Hutzel and Grammy, all that we have is a result of the fact that they cho chose to build their lives on this book. And Ethan, before you were even born, we prayed that you would make this book the foundation of your life. And maybe as I'm sharing this, you're thinking, you know, I wasn't raised in that family. Like, I didn't have that. Well, here's what's incredible. Neither did my father. He made a choice and said, I will not go the easy way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, Matthew says. Narrow is the road. This is the guide. You have the opportunity to make this book the foundation of your life. It'll change your character. It'll change your heart. It'll change how you parent. It'll change how you work. It'll change how you handle money. It's the one thing that will change your entire life if you let it. I'm not foolish enough to think that when you leave here today, all of you are going to say, yep, I'm doing it differently this time. Sadly, most of you, when you leave here, won't do, statistically, most of you won't do anything different. But I want to challenge you this morning. If you're not reading it all right now, you are not on your own. You fall right in line with most Christians. I want to challenge you. 15 minutes a day. Start there. It, that's a cup of coffee. And choose to read God's Word. 15 minutes a day, and it will change you. If you don't have a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. 
Pastor Randy will pay for it. He loves you. He'll pay for all of them. Everybody needs a new Bible. Pastor Randy will buy you new Bibles. I'm not joking, though. If you need a Bible, we will get you a Bible. 15 minutes a day. If you're already doing your devotions, I want to encourage you 30 minutes a day. There, there are those of you that are in a season of your life when you're able to, where you're able to spend an hour a day reading this book. And I think that it would be the best use of that hour of your day, bar none. Nothing else will be as impactful on your life as this book will. Jesus is the Word. The Word is the bread of life, and the Word is the foundation for life. I'm out of time. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me. One last thing I'm going to share with you. There's a man. How many are familiar with a man named David Wilkerson? Anybody? Okay. David Wilkerson was a, a pastor from Pennsylvania. He pastor at a small church in Pennsylvania. He was uh, notable for nothing. He hadn't really done anything crazy over the top special that people would know about. And this is what he did. He said, I'm going to take this book, I'm going to stop watching TV, and I'm going to start reading this book. That's all he said. I'm going to stop watching TV, and I'm going to start reading this book. And as he read that book, it changed his life. He moves to New York, starts getting involved with the two gangs called the Bishops and the Mau Mau's, gets these, these men in these gangs, Nikki Cruz and some others, saved. They start trusting, they start following Christ, and, it cre and then he creates an organization called Teen Challenge. How many have heard of Teen Challenge? Yes, a lot more hands. And this organization goes around the entire world. My father has been with Teen Challenge for 40 years and is in Tanzania, Africa right now. The whole organization existed because he said, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to start doing this. So I'm going to put you on the spot right now. I'm going to say, is there anybody in here that would say, I'm going to invest more time. I'm going to spend time reading my Bible. This week, I'm going to spend 15 minutes. Let's just start there. 15 minutes a day. Anybody say, jo they'll join me in that. I'll spend 15 minutes a day reading my Bible. I don't say if you're not going to do it. I'm not mad at you. Nobody's going to point you out. I'm telling you, if I could give you a money back time guarantee, I would, because there is nothing more important. One other thing I want to share. As you're reading this book, you're going to have questions. Okay? Ask the questions. Pastor Randy's not afraid of your questions. I'm not afraid of your questions. God's not afraid of your questions. Come on. You go to a church that tells you you can't ask questions, don't go to that church. But if you seek God in this book, you will find him. Go ahead and you can build a little bit, Brian. I want to sing a song before we go from this place. We sing it all the time here. We build our lives on all different things. But I want us to build our lives on this word. It's a firm foundation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now, I pray, God, that we would pursue you. God, and that we would find you in your word. God, that as we look into your word, we would see you. You are the word. The word is bread. The word is a foundation that we can build our lives on. And so, God, that's our heart this morning. Our heart and our desire, Father, is that we find you in your word. You are so worthy. Would you sing this with us? Come on, I will build my life. Lift your voices to him. I will build my life. Come on, sing it. I will build my life upon your life. It is a trust. I will put my trust in you alone. And I
blessed to have Pastor Pete and his wife just what a blessing. So, if, one, if you're thinking, okay, I'm up for this challenge, 15 minutes a day, but where do I start? Come Guess on. what? We got this nice little spiritual training guide we've brought back here at FCF, and we've got a daily Bible reading, meeting God in His Word every day right there laid out for you. It. it even gives you some things to think about. And if you're new to the Bible and you're like, I don't know, this book is kind of overwhelming because it, it doesn't read like a normal Bible, we have an awesome course you can read all about in that middle panel called Basics. It's coming up real soon, September 21st. We lay out for you how the Bible is laid out, help you understand it, learn how to read it. So check it out right here. Check out this whole little thing. Thank you so much for being with us today. If it's your first time, we'd love to meet you personally if you're here in the auditorium. If you wouldn't mind exiting a guest central, Pastor Pete's going to make his way over there. I think Pastor Bandy will be there as well. We'd love to say hi. If you need to talk or pray with anybody today for some challenging times, we want to just walk with you, and we'll meet you over at Care Central. Have a great day, everybody.